Hi, I'm Taryn Lupo from TarynLupo.com. Stand by to learn all about how to start your own organic garden stand. I always try to support my local farmers market and I shop there all the time. But when I drive around New Hampshire, I also see all these little farm stands that are on the side of the road. And I always wondered if those were profitable. So I decided to give someone a call who has the largest organic farm stand in all of New Hampshire and find out some tips and secrets about starting your own. I'm Rosalie Bass and I've been farming this land uh, since 1973. Uh, we are the biggest and the oldest uh, certified organic farm in New Hampshire um, and um, we are still doing it and we love it. We grow just about everything we sell in this farm stand except for peaches, um, nectarines and right now we're buying in corn but we are going to have our own corn in several weeks. Um, these are this is our biggest crop here tomatoes we sell at least a hundred pounds a day. Yesterday we sold over 200 pounds. We have an acre of you pick flowers. Um, the, the reason we got into uh, you pick flowers is we wanted something pretty to have around the farm stand um, and also something that would uh, uh, engage customers, uh, something that customers would really enjoy, uh, which is picking their own flowers. Um, we have a, it's an acre and we have a hundred different varieties and over the years we've changed varieties trying to find the best ones, uh, that, ones that the customers like, ones that last well and look beautiful. We grow two kinds of berries which are you pick berries but we also pick them for uh, customers at the farm stand. Uh, and we planted our first raspberries uh, in 1990 when we first opened the farm stand. And this bed here is quite new. Um, we began to learn more about what varieties were good and uh, how to plant them and so forth. Um, Taylors are uh, everyone's favorite. They're the best flavor but we decided to try some other uh, berries too um, and some of them were good and some of them um, didn't do as well. I have um, 240 bushes here which is actually plenty for you pickers and for us to pick um, and then also um, uh, blueberries are really easy to grow organically. Um, you can uh, just about control any problem using cultural methods um, and by that I mean uh, pruning them and uh, mulching them with wood chips. Uh, those two uh, things are what makes a really good organic bed of blueberries. Um, this is an example of uh, where we are right now. These um, bushes um, we have been picking for about two weeks and this bush is going to have many many more ripe berries. These blue ones here are ready to pick, but these here are ones that are maturing. And as you can see, there's a lot of immature fruit right now. These are, we have uh, three different varieties of blueberries here, ones that mature really early, the early blues, um, and then the patriots are next. And these are the north ones. And uh, as, you see, as you can see, we are gonna be picking from a bush like this for at least another two or three weeks. This um, is an electric fence here. This top um, ribbon has uh, wires in it and the two bottom wires um, are just uh, regular wires. And uh, we have a solar charger that works to um, keep this fence electrified. Uh, and we use it only on crops that, um, uh, that uh, pests like deer and bear and woodchucks and raccoons like to get into. And we bait uh, whichever wires we're concerned about for animals. This one here, uh, we would bait for deer and we bait it by hanging a piece of foil over it and slathering peanut butter on the foil and deer absolutely love it and they either stick their tongues or their noses on it 
and it gives them quite a shock. It, it hurts, but it doesn't harm them. But it's a good teacher. They, they, don't, uh, they, they won't go in if they've gotten shocked. Uh, I want to tell you about uh, a new thing that we have uh, learned about potatoes uh, and the potato beetle. We've learned that if you um, lay plastic um, hilled over your rows and then you plant the potatoes, uh, the seed potatoes through the plastic, that uh, you don't have a problem with the first generation of potato beetle that comes walking out of the woods. The potato beetle, uh, all of them have wings, but the first generation don't fly, so they walk come from the woods, they get to the plastic, and they can't climb up the plastic. So you have two or three weeks with no problems with potato beetles. And by the time the ones with wings come out, the plants have gotten pretty big and uh, they can't do as much damage. Uh, the other thing you may notice is there's um, low growing kale uh, planted uh, between the rows. And we did that because we've learned that the wireworm, uh, which we are losing almost half of our potato crop to, um, uh, doesn't like kale. And we don't know how well this is going to work. This is the first time we've tried it. Uh, you'll notice that uh, between the rows there's uh, grass growing and uh, that's actually not weeds. Um, it's annual ryegrass which we've planted on purpose between the rows and it has an allelopathic effect on weeds. They either don't germinate well or they don't grow well. And so it's very helpful um, to use between rows where you've um, laid plastic. Uh, the problem is with planting it next, next to the plants is you're going to have the same problem. Um, the plants won't grow well. So you want to do it where you've laid plastic. Um, lettuces are one of our 10 largest crops. Uh, we plant a crop of lettuce every week and uh, each crop has uh, 2,000 heads in it. And we start all of our seed um, indoors in uh, plug trays. Um, uh, our plug trays have 288 plugs per tray. Um, and the reason we do that is because it helps us beat the weeds to, to plant plants rather than uh, planting seed. Um, and so that works pretty well for us. And we plant, we begin planting lettuce in mid-March indoors and move it out in uh, sort of the end of April and we plant right up until mid-August. We're planting plants. And we also pick um, varieties that don't, uh, are less likely to have problems. For instance, we've uh, in the past had a lot of problem with downy mildew. And so we now pick varieties that are resistant, that have a, a resistance to downy mildew. This is a uh, three acre uh, field of winter squash and pumpkins and gourds and uh, um, and we plant some we mostly plant it from seed uh, and it is planted in rows of black plastic uh, and we do cover it with um, floating row cover um, and we keep the floating row cover on to keep the uh, striped cucumber beetle and the squash beetle off it until we have to pull the cover off because the plants are flowering and they need bees need to be able to get to the crop to um, pollinate it. We have probably about um, 10 or 12 different varieties of winter squash and and lots of varieties of pumpkins and gourds and in the fall it really is a wonderful thing for our sales and also it makes the farm stand look beautiful. Uh, this is a, a field of tomatoes and uh, rows of tomatoes with rows of uh, peppers and rows of eggplants um, growing together. And these plants like each other, so we like to plant them uh, with each other. And this is an experiment that we've tried for the first time this year. We, plant, we lay our rows of plastic where the plants are planted through and then we laid between the rows um, this um, uh, ground cover um, uh, which is called, it's called a ground, a ground cloth. Uh, and uh, um, people who grow plants to sell use it usually to keep weeds from coming up. But it works spectacularly well on this crop as you can see. 
Uh, we have, the, this is a hoop house. Um, it's, um, our hoop houses range between 14 feet and 100 feet to our biggest one, which is 30 feet by 100 feet. Um, this was the earliest planted one. We, plant, we started the plants indoors um, in mid-February and we transplanted them about uh, a couple of weeks into larger pots and then we transplanted them in this greenhouse on April 1st. Uh, and we were picking ripe tomatoes to sell at our farm stand um, in the end of June uh, and we're now at the end of uh, July or early August and we're still picking a lot of tomatoes and the reason you're not seeing any red ones is this this greenhouse was picked uh, this morning um, and I don't know how many boxes they got off them but it's it's a very effective way to grow a lot of tomatoes well uh, each line uh, we can we can squeeze in four rows in a greenhouse this size this is uh, 14 feet wide we can get a lot of tomatoes in here. They're planted a foot and a half apart. Um, and, it's, uh, and then there's a drip line that runs on, under each row and we actually have sort of a low tech way of checking for uh, whether they need watering or not. We feel they need watering at least once a day for um, two hours, but we'll check it and sometimes it needs another two hours. And the way we check it is we just pinch the soil in um, one of the rows and if the dirt holds together then it doesn't need watering again. If it crumbles we know it needs a second watering. Uh, and also I should say about these greenhouses is um, they're not the only things we grow in them. Uh, for this crop here that gets planted in April it'll be the first crop that gets planted but then we'll plant something else after this crop is done spinach or salad mix or something like that. So we do have a rotation uh, going on in the greenhouses as well. Uh, this is the last of the six houses that we built. Each one of these houses was really built by uh, two people. Uh, I was one of them for each one. Um, this house was built uh, by me and my farm manager who also now is a, a part owner with me on the farm. Um, uh, and it was quite challenging for two people to do this because we had to um, pick up these um, hoops and put them in the, the center, the ground posts. And what would happen, I was supposed, he would pick up his end and put it on, and I was supposed to pick up my end and put it on, and I wasn't strong enough to do it, so he'd have to, I'd have to hold it upright and he'd have to run across the house and put my side in too. But anyway, we did do this all ourselves. We actually uh, was a tre it, it, this is quite a high house, it's at least 20 feet high um, and the only way we could get up to it was to bring our big tractor in with a bucket and I would drive it and he would be in the bucket uh, build, putting in the, the roof pieces. Um, in here we have um, planted um, just heirlooms and as you probably can see some of them are really big We'll take a picture of a really big one that will probably weigh two pounds when it ripens. Um, and we trellis these differently. We uh, use a basket weave um, uh, system for most of our tomatoes. Uh, you have to have posts in the ground for that. Um, these are all done by hanging strings from above. And you just um, take a, uh, um, a plant like this. Uh, you take a plant like this one and you just bring it around the string. Um, you have to be careful not to break off the side branches. Um, and just wrap it around like this. And um, this will hold this plant up even when it has really big tomatoes on it. And that's what it looks like. It's pretty easy to do. And you, uh, with the other um, ways we, we grow the basket weave, we don't do a lot of pruning. You do, when you use this system, you do have to prune. You have to get the plant down to like two main shoots per plant. Um, and uh, you have a string for each shoot. But you can grow a lot of nice tomatoes in here. 
Um, last year I wrote a, a garden book uh, and it talks about how to raise everything that we raise from planting the seed to transplanting it to planting it in the ground and taking care of it and picking it. Uh, it's really a whole year's worth of advice and knowledge that uh, you that has taken me years to learn so it should be helpful moving you along um, to not not make some of the mistakes I made over the years. It's being sold at my farm stand and other bookstores and also you can get it on Amazon. And if you want to uh, uh, email me, my email is like my name, which is rosaliesgarden.com uh, um, uh, at aol.com, sorry. And um, uh, you can also write me. Uh, my address is in this book. Um, and um, call me. My telephone number is in it as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now's your chance. Just click this button right here. Also, please remember to give this video a thumbs up, a like, a share. And if you have something to add, please comment below. One last thing is stop over at Taranlupo.com.